really happy to see so many of you because usually in our mock or master contemporary art public talks, the crowds are not that big. But I'm, as Olof Olsson is already third time performing in Tallinn, I think each time the crowds will double. And we will be driving a lot of blues away here today. So uh, it will take a while. So be patient and there's a break. But Olaf will probably go over the details with you in a bit. So actually, Olaf is so far away, so I cannot give back the mic and say, hello, Olaf, welcome again to Tallinn. Really, really happy to have you. And I think uh, as long as I live, I keep inviting you back uh, and some of the students still uh, joining. So giving further, give it, passing on all of the instructions, please take the closest seats possible. Uh, yes. So Olaf, are you ready? Yes. So let's give a big applause to Olaf Olsen, driving the blues away in Tallinn. <laughs> Uh, the thanks for coming. Uh, it's extremely moving to see so many of you uh, here in Tallinn, and uh, we'll see how many of you who will be left at the end of the performance. Welcome to Driving the Blues Away, an info comedy. This performance has 16 chapters and after eight chapters, there is a break. And uh, during the performance, I'd like to ask you a favor, that when I hold up a number, you say the word chapter mm. and the word for that number. And that is so that I, between the chapters, can check that you're awake. So, so let's try. Chapter one. <laughs> Wonderful. One, one of my relationships started at an office Christmas party, but three of them ended at an office Christmas party. I don't know if this is normal or if I've been statistically unlucky. Once I suffered a breakup on Christmas Eve where the breakupper couldn't decide if she first should break up and then give me my Christmas present <laughs> or if she first should give me my Christmas present and then break up. This was so confusing that she even considered dropping the present. <laughs> but in the end, I got it. It was a blue Adidas jacket. When I grow up in the grey Swedish welfare state, we don't have a word for the colour orange. So we call it fire yellow. <laughs> Bond. Gul. The fruit, fire yellow, the fruit has always been called appelsin. <laughs> what is it in Estonian? Appelsin. Ah, okay, so you get it. Uh, <laughs> because I, I threw out, the, I, I took out the appelsin section and I threw out that sign, those signs, and, and now I, I put it in again and I forgot my signs are now, those signs are now in my apartment in Copenhagen. Uh, but, you, so you can imagine the spelling. Uh, you can imagine, you see, A-P-E-I-L-S-I-A. -E oh. You get it. Uh, <laughs> the fruit has always, in Sweden, as in Estonia, has always been called appelsin. And did you know that the sin in appelsin corresponds to the chin in China? Because appelsin means Chinese orange. Uh, 
Now, the last 25 years, I have lived in Denmark. And in Denmark, there is an orange juice called Richtig juice. In Denmark, there's an orange juice called Richtig juice, real juice. But any juice that is a juice is a juice. So to call a juice a real juice is absurd. And absurdity is something you might expect from performance art, but usually not from the juice business. <laughs> So you probably think that I made this in Photoshop. So, I brought this. <laughs> but then you think that I made this in Photoshop and folded it and glued it. And I did go to art school. I went to Konstfak in Stockholm <laughs> for two years. And I went to the Royal Academy in Copenhagen for seven years. So I do know how to fold and glue. <laughs> But info comedy, comedy has to be based on information. I can't invent a real juice just to be funny. But there's something strange about real juice. I have a Danish friend who's allergic to oranges, but she can drink real juice, <laughs> which is like Jesus born by a virgin, <laughs> which is unexpected, <laughs> especially to Joseph. <laughs> And what would God do if Adam and Eve, if Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden don't eat the apple, but instead turn it into juice? Think about it. Now, the story I will tell you tonight happened eight, nine years ago. So the facts and figures are from 2011, 2012. Now, some of the things that I say might be a bit hard to believe, but you're welcome to check it on your devices. Let's keep the door open. Yep. Uh, also, the, there might some, be some air coming in through there. Uh, and maybe we, yeah. Uh, you're welcome to check, if there's anything you, you doubt, you're welcome to check it on your devices. I just want to ask you one thing, that the facts and figures uh, that you check there, I'm not sure I got it all. Did I mention the expression facts and figures? The door, exp the, the door confused me. You see what happens when you open the door, people come in. <laughs> uh, we're just about to start. Okay, so uh, I'll do the whole thing over again. <laughs> the story I will tell you tonight happened eight, nine years ago. So the facts and figures. Did I say this? <laughs> have a seat, have a seat. Uh, it's it's going to be two and a half hours. Uh, there, there's one there, there, if you go around here, and I'm not going to do anything performative <laughs> with, I'm not going to, no, I'll, I'll, I'll turn off the lights, <laughs> I'll turn off the lights, you can in secret pass, <laughs> okay, do you want, I'll get you a chair then. <laughs> De nada. 
this is actually much nicer. <laughs> okay, the story I will tell you tonight happened seven, no, eight, nine years ago. So the facts and figures are from 2011, 2012. And some of the things that I say might be a bit hard to believe, but you're welcome to check it on your devices. She's already checking. Uh, what, what are you checking? Uh, uh, I just want to ask you one thing, that the facts and figures that you check are the facts and figures from 2011, 2012. Uh, right, okay. Um, I'll, I'll, it's too conceptual. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not that kind of performer. If a town has one Czech restaurant, it's always called It's too conceptual. Schweik. Uh, <laughs> and if there are two, the second one is always called you should stick to Czech restaurant. Czech yeah, yeah. yeah. But repetition is funny. Uh, repetition is the most undervalued aesthetical operator in the world. However, it's not true. Uh, the second one is always called Bohemia. <laughs> now, about once a month, I and my Danish orange allergic friend meet in a Czech restaurant in Copenhagen called Bohemia. One day in the restaurant, my orange allergic friend suddenly says that she's in love with me. We've just had a Czech salad. And I don't know what to say. So I say that I have to think about it. Which isn't the most elegant thing to say in such a situation when someone tells you that he or she is in love with you. And I think about it, and I get angry, because she's destroying our friendship. But then I think again, if I get so upset about this, maybe I'm already in love with her. And the more I think of how I feel, the more I know that there can be no one better I can be in love with. So I call her and ask to meet. But she is going to India early next morning. And she's a bit stressed getting ready for the trip. Um, so she says it's better to meet when she gets back in three weeks. This makes me nervous and restless. But I feel bad about having been so slow to react to her declaration of love. So I just wish her a good trip. And the three weeks go by, and I'm nervous and restless, but then she calls, and we meet again in the Czech restaurant. And I ask about the trip. Now, my friend, she flies to India with British Airways. So she has to change planes at Heathrow. At Heathrow, she goes to the bookshop to get some light reading for the flight. And in the bookshop, she buys a book about Steve Jobs, the famous Apple man. And she reads a book about Steve Jobs on the flight to Delhi. And she reads it in the taxi to the hotel. And she doesn't leave the hotel until she's finished reading the book about Steve Jobs. And during her three weeks in India, She's thinking of Steve Jobs the whole time. And she suddenly knows that she's in love with Steve Jobs. Then, on her way back, at Delhi's Indira Gandhi Airport, she goes to the bookshop to get some light reading for the flight. 
And in the bookshop, she picks up a book by Bill Gates, <laughs> the famous Microsoft man. Not because she wants to buy it, she just wants to size up the competition because she's in love with Steve Jobs. But then, with the Bill Gates book in her hand, she hears a voice. And it's the voice of Bill Gates. And she turns around, and it's Bill Gates. And Bill wants to autograph the book. But my friend doesn't want it. But she also doesn't want to hurt Bill's feelings. And she's Scandinavian. <laughs> so she doesn't have the method and flair to, so to say, negotiate such a social situation like, let's say, the British or the French. <laughs> so finally, she says that she would love to have the book autographed. And they go to the pay desk, and she feels a bit silly, but bill pays. <laughs> Cash. <laughs> With a bill. <laughs> and autographs the book and gives it to her. And my friend says, thank you. But there's a slight hesitation. And Bill finds that hesitation quite cute. So Bill says, can I buy you a Coke? <laughs> now, if Bill had offered my friend a cocktail, she would have gotten suspicious because she's Scandinavian. <laughs> but a Coke sounds completely innocent, so they go to a bar and have a Coke. And when they've had the Coke, Bill says, what are you doing now? And my friend says that she's thinking of going to the tax free shop. So they go to the tax free shop. And in the tax free shop, Bill buys her a Toporona, the Swiss triangular milk chocolate. <laughs> and then he asks her where she go she's going. And my friend says that she's going to Heathrow. And Bill says that he is going to Heathrow too. <laughs> but first he has to go to the restroom and then he'll see her at the gate. <laughs> at the gate, my friend is full of feelings. She's impressed by Bill Gates. And it takes some time for Bill to show up. And she starts to feel nervous and restless. And she suddenly knows that she's in love with Bill Gates. That through buying her a Toblerone, Bill has made her fall in love with him. Her mother and father never bought her Toblerone. <laughs> Even though they went on holiday with the car every summer and sailed on car ferries with tax free shops. And in the tax free shop, she always wanted Toblerone, the Swiss triangular milk chocolate but her mother and father never let her have it. Now, after having bought my friend the Toporona she so badly needed, Bill has not been to the restroom. Bill has been on the phone because Bill wasn't going to Heathrow, but now he is, and he's booked two tickets for first class. And at the gate, Bill Gates asks my friend if she would like to join him in first class. So she gets to sit in first class between Indra Gandhi Airport <laughs> and Heathrow Airport beside the second richest person in the world, according to the facts and figures of 2011, 2012. <laughs> and at Heathrow, they go to a luxury airport hotel. And at the hotel, they get a room and in the room, my friend has never felt a softer bed. It's like it's made of toast bread before it's been toasted. When I had 
Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden eat the apple from the tree of knowledge. The first thing they get to know is that they're naked. <laughs> so they make aprons of fig leaves and put them on. So by eating one apple, two people give birth to two billion dollar industries. <laughs> Fashion and pornography. Fashion, because suddenly, not being naked is a big deal. And pornography, because suddenly, being naked is a big deal. I wrote that in the weekend. It goes out again. No reaction. In 1797, <laughs> Immanuel Kant defines marriage as a contract for the mutual use of the sexual organs. Now, to some, breaking such a Kantian contract isn't a major moral meltdown. It's just something confused that can happen, especially if the office Christmas party is full of snow. And I and that orange allergic Dane didn't even have a Kantian contract. But even if we did, and she sleeps with Bill Gates, I don't have the right to be bitter because it can't count to have sex with someone without a body. Now, when I talk about someone without a body, you might wonder, what do I mean? And how would someone without a body looks, look like? Well, that's easy. Someone without a body looks like Bill Gates. signs of bodies but as a sophisticated audience you know that having a body is in the end a matter of attitude it's something that takes place in the brain it is a question of philosophy and an American or English philosopher would never be so blunt as Immanuel Kant and define marriage as a contract for the mutual use of the sexual organs and an American or English philosopher would never be called Kant because Kant means wherever And the Americans and the English can't even make proper chocolate. So they buy European chocolate, but they can't enjoy it because they don't have bodies. 
They don't. They don't have borders. They don't. But I'm not trying to say that not having body necessarily is a bad thing. Because isn't it exactly through not having a body, Bill Gates gets to drive to become the second richest person in the world. Just like Carlos Slim becomes the richest person in the world through being left-handed, watch to watch. And like Barack Obama becomes the president of the United States through being left-handed, watch the pen. And if this presidential pen suddenly gets empty, the Americans don't take any chances. There are 19 backup pens. <laughs> Careful there with the camera, please. Have a good night. But I'm not trying to say that someone without a body can't be sexy. Even Bill Gates can be sexy. <laughs> they even put him in Playboy as the Superman of software. <laughs> Except in the Czech edition, where they put Stephen Hawking instead. <laughs> I don't know why. I've performed this four times in, in the Czech Republic. I've asked them every time. They can't explain. <laughs> My Dutch Catholic mother meets my Swedish social democrat father on the Spanish island of Mallorca over a Cuba Libra. <laughs> a Cuba Libra is made of rum, Coca-Cola, and a slice of lime. When my mother and father meet on Mallorca, it's the first time they've been flying and they are confused from the flying. And they are intoxicated by the Cuba Libra, and they are excited by the flamenco music from the speaker system in the bar. <laughs> so they fall in love. <laughs> and my mother gets pregnant with me. And I should have been born exactly at Christmas just like Jesus. <laughs> but I'm six days late. <laughs> and that lack of timing has followed me ever since. I grew up in Helsingborg, which is as close in Sweden you can get to Denmark, to Elsinore, Helsingør, the, the city of Hamlet. And if Helsingborg is the San Diego of Sweden. Elsinore is the Tijuana of Denmark. Yeah, I take some knowledge of geography there. Um, <laughs> I'm keeping it. When I grow up, there is a tale that if you take a tooth and put it in a glass of Coca-Cola at night, the tooth will be gone in the morning. <laughs> but that doesn't keep me from drinking Coca-Cola. And when I drink Coca-Cola, I believe that I drink a part of America. Just like the Catholics believe that they eat a part of Jesus every Sunday in church, even if it isn't vegan. <laughs> Coca-Cola turn the nasty Nordic Tom Denise into a much sexier Santa Claus. <laughs> Coca 
Coca-Cola is called Coca-Cola because Coca-Cola is made of coca and cola. Yes, it's that simple. Coca from Latin America and cola from West Africa. Now, coca contains cocaine. And this early hipster <laughs> clearly drinks Coca-Cola because of the cocaine as well as this one. Now, Coca-Cola is invented in 1886 and Coca-Cola say that Coca-Cola hasn't contained any cocaine since 1904. So before Coca-Cola put coca in the coke, they remove the cocaine at a high security facility. But what happens then to all that snow? <laughs> Do they send it back <laughs> to Latin America? Or do they save it and hide it for the office Christmas party? <laughs> In 1863, and, and I can't speak French, so pardon my, my, my attempts here. In 1863, Angelo Mariani invents, maybe, Uh, he, he's, uh, he's watering a plant here, and you'll s soon understand which kind of plant it is. Angelo Mariani, in 1963, 1863, invents vin Mariani, a French wine with cocaine. Now, this is a very clever way to make something popular. It's a very clever way to make something popular. You take a new idea like cocaine and put it in the body of an old idea, like a bottle of wine. And the magic is that the reverse works just as well. <laughs> like an aerodynamic pencil sharpener. <laughs> you should have this in your curriculum. This is the most important thing, at least for the design students. At least, not for the art students, they don't care. But the design students, here we have an old idea, a pencil, pencil sharpener, in the body of a new idea, aerodynamics. A new idea in the body of an old idea. A, an old idea in the body of a new idea. <laughs> this bottle of Vermeigny is greeted by an angel saying, Ave Mariani. Hail Mariani. It's made by the French painter Luc Olivier Merson, uh, who's a very versatile artist. He designs stamps and bills for the French state. He paints the awakening of spring with spring sleeping. And, uh, and this is, of course, totally sexist, right? Why, why, why isn't spring a man here? Uh, uh, or why, why, you know, why does spring have to be naked? Uh, those were the times. Uh, with spring sleeping and a little putto, th this is even worse, a naked child, uh, a little putto waking up spring with a Scottish bagpipe. <laughs> the worst way in the world <laughs> to wake up. <laughs> and he paints the Annunciation, but now he's gone avant-garde and blurry, so it's a bit hard to see that this is the angel Gabriel and this is the Virgin Mary, like in the much clearer Annunciation by Botticelli. Uh, an almost perfect piece of art. There's just one little mistake Botticelli did. We'll come back to that. 
a bit, uh, a bit, a bit later. Uh, now, in the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel, this is a man, the angel Gabriel, because, again, heaven is sexist. Only men get to be angels. Uh, you know, don't believe those paintings with female angels. They are from Protestants. It's like fake propaganda from Protestants. They are all men. Uh, a, a, a bit, a bit uh, what, what, what they call it in the, in the zeros? Uh, metro, it's a metrosexual man, but still it's a man. Uh, the angel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary, and Gabriel says to Mary that she will get pregnant. And she'll give birth to a son, and she'll call him Jesus. But Mary wonders how she can get pregnant as a virgin. But Gabriel answers directly from the King James Version. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. <laughs> Which doesn't mean what you think. <laughs> what happens is that the Holy Ghost bonks the Virgin Mary, but Mary doesn't notice it because the Holy Ghost is a spiritual entity without a body. <laughs> Which is why Gabriel is holding a white lily, a symbol of purity. And you, so you see, the most important thing in this painting is this white lily. So why is Gabriel holding that in his left hand behind him? It should be in the right hand. He could, that gesture, you could still see if he did it with the left hand. That it would protrude there, you could see it. But, but the, the, the white lily is half hidden, especially for those of you who are stupid enough to sit in the back. <laughs> uh, so there's a little problem, you know, uh, if, 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 if we would have a, a school critique there and Botticelli would be there, I would be wondering, should I bring this up? Or, you know, would, would that, you know, would, would Botticelli take it too badly? <laughs> now, this angel is holding a palm branch, a symbol of victory. And in the Bible, the Palm branch symbolizes Jesus' victory over death. And according to these famous French people, their Mayani can almost give you eternal life. Their Mayani is a fountain of spring, gives life and vigor. Yes, this, these French people speak English because these are made for the American market. <laughs> their Mayani you see, they are superstars. Exquisite in taste is health, elixir of life. <laughs> then I need prolongs life. It is wonderful. <laughs> Honor to then my knee. It restored my health. Then my knee made a new man of me. <laughs> there my knee is perfect. It drives away the blues. Here, we have a nun nurse with a man in a hospital bed, and he's doing fine because of the Mariani wine. <laughs> he even has the energy to flirt with a non-nurse. <laughs> While here, we completely don't believe in the setup. Uh, this could be a hospital, but this does not look like a battlefield. <laughs> and the acting is not convincing. <laughs> this is a painting by Manet. Manet. Mani? Mani? Uh, <laughs> Merci. Uh, this is a painting by Mani. Uh, uh, showing Henri Rochefort. <laughs> Merci. Uh, this is a painting. <laughs> I'll go out of the image, and then we'll, connect it. we'll edit this after. I'll have go out for some water. Mm. 
Rodríguez. This is a painting by Manet <laughs> showing uh, Henri Rochefort escaping the French colony, New Caledonia. Nouvelle Caledonie. Uh, I don't know why it's not called Nouveau Caledonie. Uh, it's Nouvelle Caledonie. Merci. Uh, escaping uh, New Caledonia, where he's been held as a political prisoner by the French state. And maybe you think that he manages to escape by looking like Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> and when he leaves, he says to the guards, I'm Charlie Chaplin. I've been here to cheer up the prisoners, and now I'm taking the boat back to Hollywood. But this is before Chaplin is born, and Hollywood is just full of trees, so he must have used another method. Back in Paris, Rochefort advertises Vin Mariani. Vin Mariani completely reformed my constitution. You should offer some to the French government. <laughs> and in the Vatican, Pope Leo XIII, Chao, gets so enthusiastic about Vermayani that he gives it the papal gold medal. And yes, this is authentic. In the United States, in the late 1800s, there are many wounded soldiers from the Civil War addicted to morphine, and one of the addicted is John Pemberton in Atlanta. But Pemberton has an idea that morphine addiction can be cured with a cocaine cure. <laughs> and inspired by the fabulous global success of Vin Mayani, Pemberton launches a sort of copy product, Pemberton's French wine, coca. But in 1886, Atlanta gets prohibition, making wine, making wine illegal, but not cocaine. So Pemberton just replaces the wine with water, with bubbles. This is the birth of Coca-Cola, the intellectual beverage. <laughs> In 1943, Jean-Paul Sartre... <laughs> 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 it should be my Paul. Paul, Jean-Paul. Jean-Paul. <laughs> uh, in 1943, Sartre <laughs> publishes Being a Nothingness. <laughs> where he writes that we can never be completely happy because the ex existential void is always lurking around the corner. At the same time, during the Second World War, Coca-Cola promised Coke to all American soldiers, wherever they happen to be, to keep it, they build 64 new factories all around the world. And while Sartre is stuck, drifting between being and nothingness, Coca-Cola conquer the world as the real thing. In 1975, at Pepsi, 
In Purchase, New York, in Purchase, New York, yes, there is such a place. <laughs> John Scully invents the Pepsi challenge, a blind taste test between Pepsi and Coke, and it turns out that more people prefer Pepsi. And in Atlanta, Georgia, Coca-Cola get nervous. Uh, uh, and the reason people uh, prefer Pepsi is because Pepsi is sweeter. Pepsi is sweeter. So in Atlanta, Georgia, Coca-Cola get nervous. And in 1985, Coca-Cola launched a new sweeter Coke, a new sweeter Coke called New Coke, uh, which in Cuba, Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro calls symptomatic of American decay. <laughs> Now, when this picture is published, the, the Cuban communist government issues a clarification that Fidel Castro doesn't drink Coca-Cola. He just accepted this one out of politeness. <laughs> now, the Coca-Cola bottle is patented in 1915 by uh, Alexander Samuelson. And uh, Samuelson wants the bottle to express Coca-Cola's ingredients, so he sends two assistants to the local library to read about Coca and Cola in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, but they don't get inspired. But one of the assistants happens to turn a few pages from Coca to Coco to cocoa, the raw material of chocolate, and sees in, in, the, in the Encyclopedia Britannica an illustration of a cocoa pod. And the cocoa pod becomes the model for the bottle. And first, the cocoa shape is adopted quite literally. Yes, this is authentic. I didn't do anything with this in Photoshop. I, I did. I, I gave it some unsharp mask. That's it. That's it. Uh, why, why you should sharpen with unsharp mask? I don't know. This is what they say. I've been, that's what my photo teacher said. Use unsharp mask to make it sharper. Uh, um, maybe we, some, someone can explain in the brick. Uh, this is authentic, but such a bottle uh, can easily fall, uh, so, so they slim it. But thick or thin, Coca-Cola is living in a fake body, because there's no cocoa in Coca-Cola. Now, one of the reasons that Americans, do we have any Americans here today? <laughs> now it's like, in, like a stand-up comedy. Do we have any Americans? <laughs> uh, is there anyone here who was, who was born? Uh, OK. Uh, but. You can ask them. Uh, one of the reasons that Americans think that Europe is suspicious is that a European can of Coke is 7% smaller than an American can of Coke. And they wonder what exactly happens <laughs> to those 7%. of Coca-Cola. There are people without bodies who would like to have a body. They drink normal Coke. And there are people without bodies who don't want to have a body. 
they drink Diet Coke. And that's the kind of Coke drinker Bill Gates is. <laughs> In 1492, the Spanish invade Cuba. And in 1519, from Cuba, they invade, in, they in, in, invade, invade, invade uh, Mexico, uh, where the Aztecs drink a thick brown drink called cacao. Atl, made of cocoa and water. Now, the, uh, the Spanish, they, uh, they like the Aztec cocoa, uh, but they don't like the name, because in Spanish, the word coca means poop. And the Spanish, they don't like the idea of drinking a thick brown drink <laughs> with coca in it. So they call it chocolate. And in the Vatican, Pope Alexander VII gets so enthusiastic about cocoa that he says that Catholics can drink it even when they fast. Now, the Aztecs, they use cocoa as an aphrodisiac, which has nothing to do with Africa. But with Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, who in Nordic mythology corresponds to Freya. Yes, these are cats. <laughs> Who's given name to the day Friday, because in the north, apart from the office Christmas party, it's on Fridays, people get drunk and high and procreate. <laughs> this is a mural by Diego Rivera showing the Aztec god, Aztec god Quetzalcoatl. Here is a drawing from the 1500s. And as you see, Quetzalcoatl isn't vegan. Now, in Aztec mythology, Quetzalcoatl leaves the other gods and comes down to earth, and with him, he brings cocoa. And in Cholula, Mexico, people built the biggest pyramid in the world in the honor of Quetzalcoatl. It's the biggest pyramid in the world, 50% bigger than the biggest one in Egypt, corresponding exactly, exactly to 80 million banana boxes. 80 million banana boxes. Now, since this isn't in Egypt, things start to grow on it, make, starting to make it look like a mountain. And on top of this mountain-like pyramid, the Spanish put a Catholic church. And in the church, they put the Virgin Mary dressed up as a pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> now, a cocoa bean is 50% fat, but in 1828, the Dutch cocoa company Van Houten, uh, they get a patent for a method to separate the fat from the cocoa. And separating the fat from the cocoa gives birth to cocoa powder, while adding more fat creates the chocolate bar. Here is a man on a train drinking Van Houten cocoa. And you see, he gets all the attention, all the attention of ladies. Even this beautiful boy is clearly interested. <laughs> Here on this train, we have a, some kind of cross between <laughs> a human and a chocolate bar. <laughs> and the human is some kind of cross between Tintin and Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and it's fascinating how he can relax with such a stiff body. 
Van Houten, they use all kinds of advertising methods, Rembrandt-like, as well as avant-garde. Traditionally Dutch, as well as sporty. <laughs> Dogs at a dinner table. Dogs can't eat chocolate or drink. They're completely allergic to it. They can die. Ducks in a photo studio. <laughs> Exotic. I don't... The best description I can... Give this is cosmic sex. <laughs> Laurel and Hardy and someone we don't know. <laughs> that was like never written as a joke, but people always laugh at someone we don't know. What, what, is, what is funny? I don't know what's funny. I don't think you know what's funny either. Uh, please tell me in the break, but uh, it, people always laugh there. Uh, uh, mountaineers, even though we do know that the Netherlands <laughs> is the flattest nation in the world. <laughs> and finally, and this is not for the fra fragile, a little child kidnapped by Tom Denisa. <laughs> Another Dutch cocoa company, Droste, use a nun nurse in heavy makeup and herself on the tin, <laughs> giving birth to the so-called droste effect in front of a background of exciting orange. <laughs> in 1875, in Switzerland, Daniel Peter invents Gala Peter, die erste Milchschokolade der Welt, the first milk chocolate in the world. Jede andere Marke ist Nachahmung. Every other brand is an imitation. And you can get Gala Peter from a camel in the desert. And you can get it from a nun nurse in the snow. <laughs> and Galapeto is high as the Alps in quality, but Galapeto is completely forgotten today. Galapeto is the first milk chocolate, but Toblerone, they get a patent. The first patented Swiss milk chocolate. And while Galapeto is the first milk chocolate, Toborona put a one in Toborona. <laughs> People say I go too fast here, so I now I try to really hammer in the one. <laughs> and while Galapeto put a man on a mountain, Toborona. Is the mount. <laughs> <laughs> this is an ad for Toborona in Esperanto with an eagle over a Swiss mountain landscape <coughs> with the flags of Switzerland and Esperanto. And it's fascinating that Theodor Toblo who invents Toblerone in 1908, so much, much later than Galapieto, who invents Toblerone in 1908, is engaged in a hopelessly utopian language project like Esperanto, while he at the same time turns Toblerone into fabulous global success. This is a clear reference to the Virgin Mary in a classical triangular composition. This here, 
symbolizes a halo, a Gloria, like, like the song by Laura Branigan. <laughs> Here are the three magi. The first one with Toblerone. <laughs> But what is going on here? Why is he in a pink dimension? <laughs> what is this green thing? <laughs> and why is there only an audience of one? There will be a 15 minute break. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Also, uh, it might be good to know that the second section will be slightly shorter than the first one. Slightly shorter. There's a bar outside. And there's a bar outside. Just outside here. <laughs> <laughs>